Guten Abend, meine Damen und Herren, liebe Kolleginnen und Kollegen, liebe Gäste. Good evening, or in some cases, good morning, dear colleagues, dear guests. My name is Katja Piska. I am the head of the Architekturreferat, that is a division of building archaeology at the Wissenschaftliche Abteilung, which is part of the head office of the German Archaeological Institute. I would like to welcome you to a new chapter of our lecture series, DIA Insight, Neue Forschung am DIE 2021. And as most of you probably already know that within this series, every month, one of the departments of the German Archaeological Institute offers insights into its current research. In July, it's the Wissenschaftliche Abteilung at the head office in Berlin, which is presenting itself with two lectures, one today, and another one in two weeks on the 21st of July. Today's lecture, which will be held in English, is given by Dr. Stefan Zink, one of my colleagues at the Division of Building Archaeology, whom I would like to welcome and introduce briefly. I may add that Stefan Zink and I have had the opportunity to present and introduce each other on various occasions. And uh, when he told me to keep it short today, I decided to follow his advice. Stefan originally studied classical archaeology in Vienna, Berlin, and Paris, and then went on to the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, and I would hope to become better acquainted with the methodology of Bauforschung, building archaeology, among other things. He finished his PhD in Philadelphia with an in-depth study of the Palatine Sanctuary of Apollo in Rome, a project that sparked his interest in Bauforschung, Republican and Imperial building processes in the heart of Rome, architectural polychromy, and the development of a sacred topography from the Roman Republic to the Roman Empire. All of these questions play an important role in his current field project at Lago Argentina in Rome as well. After finishing his PhD in Philadelphia, Stefan moved on to the Swiss Federal Institute of, in, uh, of Technology in Zurich, where he pursued his interest in ancient architectural polygamy and surfacing. During that time, he also started to work at Lago Argentina, teaching two summer courses for the American Academy in Rome at the site in 2014 and 16. In 2017, Stefan brought this project, which he carries out in cooperation with Monica Cecchi and Jens Flug, to the Architekturreferat. And I believe he can and will tell this story better than me. For now, I would like to add a small technical note. Please feel free to ask questions at any time during or after the lecture in the chat. That can be done by clicking on the blue icon at the bottom right of the page, or if you're watching us on YouTube, in the YouTube chat. We will collect the questions and pass them on to Stefan. If you would like to name your name to be mentioned, please sign the question with your name. And with this, I would like to leave the floor to Stefan. We are very much looking forward to your lecture entitled How a Temple Survives, Investigating Building Life Cycles at Lago Argentina in Rome. So, yeah, thank you very much, Katja, for the kind uh, introduction. Um, this was the, the short version, um, thank you. Um, so, uh, and also first of all, welcome everyone and uh, thank you for being curious enough uh, to tune in on this talk, which I will hold in English as it relates uh, to an international collaborative project between Germany and Italy and English became our lingua franca for publications and presentations at least. So, in the next 40 minutes, um, I would like to give you some insights into an ongoing project uh, which seeks to improve our knowledge on ancient Roman architecture. I would like to look with you at some of the questions that we can pose uh, to, the, to the ancient ruin of a temple and show you some of the methodologies that we can apply uh, for answering these questions. And as you can see in this list on the, on the left, um, a substantial team is involved in this project, uh, including myself, we are 14 people. So I would like to stress that I'm only bringing together here the multiple contributions and insights of all of these people. So together we are uh, attempting to revise the architectural narrative of um, the site known as Largo di Torre Argentina. This is not any site in Rome. It is in fact a rather unique uh, peephole into Rome's urban development. And uh, this is exactly what I want to suggest with this picture. 
its remains really reach from uh, Roman antiquity, on which I will focus, uh, to the Christian conversion of the ancient cityscape uh, during the medieval periods, uh, then its Baroque embellishment, the 19th century urbanization, and eventually the fascist transformation of the site into an archaeological area and its preparation as a ruin. So the wider uh, area of Largo Argentina was known in antiquity as Campus Martius. As the name reveals, this was a vast field. Uh, it's located over here. Um, originally, it was a marshland that was embraced and still is embraced by the Tiber River on three sides. And this topographical situation uh, is important as it represented a constant challenge uh, for its buildings because the area was regularly flooded. And for this very reason, the early settlements of Rome were all located on top of Rome's hills. But by the third century BCE, the city began to outgrow these areas and spread out to the campus marshes. And the site of Lago Argentina therefore provides some key evidence for Rome's urban sprawl. Today, uh, Lago Argentina still lies within a densely built uh, zone of Rome histor Rome's historic center. And it occupy, occupies the area of an entire building block. It is located a few meters below the modern street level, and it contains four ancient temples, which are aligned in a row and all face east towards uh, a paved area. This is the paved area. And in lack of a secure identification of the gods to which uh, these temples were uh, once dedicated, uh, they were labeled A, B, C, and D. Um, the latter temple, D, is half buried under the modern street. But I will not enter here into the rather complicated current theories regarding the identification of the buildings. Instead, let's move on uh, to Temple A of Largo Argentina, the building which is at the focus of this talk. Um, it saw 2,200 years of cultic history. From an ancient temple first dedicated during the mid around the mid third century BCE to a medieval church, which was only demolished in the 1920s. And uh, here you see nestled into the cellar of the Roman temple, the apse or the remains uh, of the medieval church. So let me come to the overarching question that I would like to address in the following. It is actually a rather, a rather simple question. How is it possible that this temple is still here? And how did it survive? And how come the ruin looks the way it does? In a way, one could say, I'm trying to address here the ontology of this archeological site. So why does it exist in its current form? And what factors constituted it? It's quite a basic question, I would say, almost a question a child would ask. Um, in order to seek answers to this question, my team and I have applied uh, different, different investigative methods, uh, which I will also introduce in this talk. They allow us to identify the traces of various life cycles uh, of the temple's existence over the course of half a millennium, and to provide some answers on how the temple survived. On an interpretational level, um, I will make an attempt to explain these life cycles or the traces which allow us to pinpoint them rather through their own dynamic environment. Uh, this includes, for example, a changing urban topography, especially urban densification. As shown in this map of the Augustan campus marshes, um, already by the Augustan period, all kinds of buildings blocked the spatial development of Temple A on all sides. And as the city was growing, uh, space became a rare good. And I would like to show you later how this has directly affected the architecture and the design of Temple A. As I said before, floods from the nearby Tiber were a constant threat in the campus marshes. And even until the early 20th century, as you see in the upper image. And the archeological as well as the textual sources also inform us about a series of devastating fires, which took place almost every few decades. And how did building patrons, architects and craftsmen deal with the challenge of having to rebuild or restore entire areas after such catastrophic events? How did they deal with the economic and log logistical challenges that come along with the task of reactivating entire city quarters? 
And did such environmental factors perhaps even influence the design of buildings and thus have an impact on the nature of Roman architecture? I believe that I can show uh, you some evidence at Temple A, which allows us to answer also these questions. The site of Lago Argentina also spans the time period of a major regime change. Uh, I'm talking about the transition from the Roman Republic to the empire. And one of the key events in this political change was the assassination of Julius Caesar, as you all know. And as it happens, uh, this event took place right at our site, uh, somewhere within the Red Circle. And in fact, uh, this is one of the main reasons why tourists visit the site today, in addition to the cat asylum. Um, but did the socio-political change from Republic to Empire also have an impact on the architecture of Temple A? After all, during the Republic, it was an aristocratic elite who shared the political power among them, and they were the ones who built and maintained the temples. But with Augustus, it was one man and his administrative units who took over control and who were in charge of the public buildings in Rome. So to my mind, some of the architectural phenomena at Temple A relate to this changing socio-political context. So um, let's talk about the tools that we apply in order to construct the life cycles of Temple A. And uh, believe it or not, we began with this set of crayons. Um, when we started the, pro the research project in 2018, we were fortunate uh, enough to receive from the archive of the superintendents a series of unpublished plans and sections. And uh, this is a good moment uh, when you look at these plans uh, to introduce you uh, to uh, the two levels of this site, which are kind of important to understand uh, uh, some of the later arguments. So here on the top, uh, here you see the top view of the temple and next to it, uh, um, these are the remains that are located underground in an artificial basement level. So in the longitudinal section uh, below, you can see how these, how these levels relate uh, to each other. So this is the underground level and this all here is the upper level. This set of plans uh, that you see here is of great deep quality and of great uh, detail, um, but um, it came to us without an interpretation. So the first thing that we did was to take them as the basis for a close analysis of the construction phases, meaning we checked the stratigraphic relationship of each feature to its neighboring feature and thus determined its place in a relative chronological sequence. So here is where the color come into, uh, the crayons come into a play because each of them uh, represents a phase. So overall, we found 18 construction phases um, from the third century BCE to the Baroque period. And 12, 12 of them are ancient. The temple itself revealed eight construction phases and uh, before uh, it was thought that there were only four. So while the plans are very helpful, we also realized that there were areas of key importance which needed additional documentation. Also, we noted a few inconsistencies between the different levels, and these uh, seem to have to do with the fact that it's just not easy to correctly bring together the lower and the upper level of the site, also for a lack of visual connection. Therefore, um, we decided to do a full re-measuring of the site. Uh, until not so long ago, this would have meant a survey with a laser equipped total station with which thousands of points are individually taken. But now uh, it is possible to establish a photorealistic 3D model through a photogrammatic range imaging technique called structure from motion. The specialists among you, of course, know all this. The precision of all of this is far below a centimeter. And uh, for the lower level of the site, uh, our model consists now of 6,000 photographs. And the video that you see here shows the process of how these photos were taken. It's almost like a sort of uh, dance of several people. And as you can see, lighting is of course key, as well as cleaning the room beforehand, which can take a considerable time. And for the upper level, uh, it, that was a little bit easier. Uh, 
we were able to use uh, drone imaging. The picture that you see here on the right was just taken um, uh, a few weeks ago. Um, here on the left, I show you the SFM model of the site's lower level in a top view uh, with the artificial ceiling, which protects uh, the basement level ever since the 1930s. So we're basically looking down on the ceiling. And what is really helpful, the model allows us to virtually remove the ceiling and gain an unobstructed view on the remains. And uh, I'll show you now, when I click, you will see what this means. This is how it looks when we lift the cover. Um, and on the, on the right side, uh, you are looking at a part of the model uh, with the superimposed altars of the first and second phase. So we're basically looking into this area here, um, as well as uh, the modern support pillars here uh, under the different pavement blocks. The space down there is very narrow. It's actually quite difficult uh, to take pictures. Um, but when we remove the ceiling, when we virtually remove the ceiling, we can look at it from vantage points that are otherwise impossible to achieve. So in other words, the structure from motion technique allows us to simulate a situation almost like right after excavation and before the construction of the ceilings. And here you see the preliminary 3D model of the site's upper level, uh, which is the result of a drone survey that we carried out, as I said, uh, really just a few weeks ago. So this is a reduced low res resolution version of the model, hence uh, the roundish edges and a little bit blurry effects sometimes. And uh, with uh, 360 gigabytes, uh, the full model is rather large and difficult, difficult to handle. And all this is uh, now actually in the process of calculation. So the animation is also just a preliminary version and a bit bumpy. But I think it gives you a first impression of what can be achieved uh, with this uh, technique uh, and with all its limitations. Well, okay, while uh, the animated models are somewhat nice to look at and people are always very enthusiastic about them and they're in fact helpful for creating virtual viewpoints, um, I would like to stress that they are for us, uh, they're not an analytical documentation. They're in fact only the pre-stage of that. The actual analytical stage is what you see here in the lower right uh, down here. It is the hand drawing. And it is for them that we actually need the SFM models. Uh, so we use the digital to enable the analog, and then we go back to the digital for the analog. Um, from the 3D models, we can generate any plan, uh, section of the elevation that we want and print it out in a desired scale, like here. Um, it provides then the basis for a hand drawing, uh, which has the precision of uh, digital measuring. And on the left, uh, upper left, you see Bernd Ma as he's using an improvised light table to transfer the outlines from the printed model onto paper. And then in the lower image, he sits in front of the wall and draws all features and adds detail. Um, the legibility of the hand drawing is, um, as you can see, uh, far better than the SFM elevation. Um, just compare these two images. Um, the SFM suffers, uh, for example, from the fact that it is not possible to create equal lighting in every corner. And, uh, the drawing, on the other hand, uh, reduces all uninformative noise and it brings out only the relevant features. At the same time, the process of drawing forces a close observation and generates insights on construction techniques and construction phases. It is, it is basically the drawing is an epistemic process that is very important. In a similar way, we approach the architectural members, uh, the fragments of the temple's elevation. And Daniel Schneider, the colleague in this image, uses low tech here to produce what you see on the right measured hand drawing. In this case, it's a column base. Um, and this is how it has really been done since the time of Andrea Palladio. So, but these drawings, you can say, really encapsulate everything we need to know to put the puzzle together. The shape of the piece, its main measurements and dimensions, and its state of preservation, uh, meaning the missing versus the extant part. So, in a way, uh, our methodological approach really tries to take the best from both worlds, the digital and the analog. 
So now, okay, uh, let's move on uh, to the results. Uh, we begin with the earliest mid-Republican phase. Um, its remains are rather substantial, and uh, this makes the reconstruction of the temple's plan with four columns in the front, as you can see here, uh, and two on the side, rather well-founded. Also, the podium is exceptionally well-preserved. Uh, it features a lower part of coarsely worked national masonry, so that would be this part here, and an upper part that is carefully carved. Um, as you can see on the very left, um, uh, where the, how, you can see on the very left how exceptionally well preserved the upper part is and so this transition is almost from the is almost like a transition from the natural form to the artistic form so overall this podium was almost four meters high and uh, this unusual height was probably meant to protect it from flooding while turning a rather small temple into a visually imposing building and i should make a remark also on the elevation and on the drawing that you see on the very right um, I'm only able to show you here for each phase a schematic representation of the podium and two columns. Uh, we are not there yet to have reconstructed uh, the full facade. Um, but uh, these give you the form um, as well as the position of the columns in relation to each other. And this uh, intercolumnation, as it's called, has a large impact on the visual effect of a facade. And it is kind of like a basic ingredient of ancient uh, temple design. Um, more than 4,000 architectural members are currently in the storage rooms at the site. And from these, we have to reconstruct the temple's ele elevation, meaning its columns and its entablature. So this uh, sounds um, like an almost impossible undertaking, but fortunately, there is a sequence of construction stones which applies to the entire uh, area of Lago Argentina. And it is quite evident that the so-called Peperino Tufa, which you see here in uh, this piece, uh, uh, was used only for the earliest buildings at the site, meaning for the third century BCE phases of temples A and temple C. So this material selection limits the options or limits our options from 4,000 to 150 pieces. Important also, all of them come from the excavations at the site, and for some of them, we even know the fine spot. So um, our, the, the next challenge is then, we have fragments of temple A and C mixed together. So the next question is how to separate them. And um, fortunately, again, our study of the fragments in the storage rooms revealed two different sets of calendar orders, one much larger than the other. And uh, since Temple C um, was from the outset much larger than Temple A, it seemed logical to attribute the smaller column set to Temple uh, A. Moreover, there are the distinct stylistic and also technical differences between these column sets. As you can see in the image at the, on the right, at Temple A, for example, the individual column drums here uh, were joined with vertical dowels, uh, of which the holes and the pouring channel uh, to fix them are preserved. So at Temple C, however, the drums only show an anaterosis, uh, a carved out central area that was meant to reduce the contact surface to an outer ring. I will now rather quickly just show you how we are puzzling together the earliest phase of Temple A from these 150 pieces. This is the column base, uh, which is, or yeah, actually the only surviving column base, only partially preserved. Uh, and uh, we had to reconstruct it, uh, its missing parts, as you can see on the very right. Uh, so for example, here, the transition between the drum and the column shaft remains unclear. And this is why we decided uh, to um, suggest two possibilities. And for the sake of time, I will skip the reconstruction of a column sh a shaft and move to the capital, which is uh, a rather uh, new uh, study that you see here. On the left, you see all the capital fragments in Peperino Tufa that we found in the storage rooms. Um, among the small, smaller set, uh, the ones of Temple A, were five volutes, um, uh, such as the one that you see uh, on the right in an animated SFM model. 
Notable also are the three pieces uh, in the central image. These are fragments of a ionic egg and dart freeze here, uh, and two palmettes springing out of uh, oval medallions. Uh, the size of the volutes, as well as the fact that they are two-faced, um, suggests that they come from so-called italic ionic capitals. Um, how these look like, uh, you see here. These are our recent attempts, uh, they are preliminary, uh, to figure out uh, to which type the extant pieces may belong. On the left, um, a reference from Palestrina, which, uh, for example, unites all features that we have preserved. Two-faced volutes, an echinus with an egg and dart molding, and palmettes that were slightly oblique and sprang from the echinus. And on the right, uh, an insight into how we currently reconstruct the capitals on the basis of SFM models of each piece. So um, this is really um, in, the, uh, in the making at the moment. What is remarkable about this, cover, about this discovery, we seem to have found here the earliest appearance of this capital type in Rome. Um, um, then this very badly preserved fragment of the Doric Corius, uh, also in Peperino Tufa, seems uh, to belong to the upper areas of our temple, and we are now just moving into the entablature. Um, it attests the use of a Doric order above the architrave. In other words, the temple featured Italic Ionic capitals and a Doric frieze above. Uh, the architrave, however, was probably carried out in wood, as it was very difficult to span the free distance between col uh, two columns with the friable uh, tufa stone. And for this, uh, for uh, the implementation, uh, for the use of uh, wooden architects also speak the many pieces of architectural terracotta which were found at the site. Almost 500 are now in the storage rooms and the study of this material was recently begun and it already led to promising results. Uh, with the help of the excavation notes from the 1930s, it was possible to attribute uh, 94 fragments to Temple A. Among them are also these roof criteria, which are alternating female and male winged figures. So now this would be the moment to show you a nice 3D reconstruction of the earliest phase of Temple A uh, from the podium to the roof. But we are not there yet, uh, perhaps in a year from now. Um, as a visual reference, uh, so that you get an idea of the aesthetics, I show you here two temples from the 4th and 3rd century BC, both uh, from outside of Rome. The left is an example of an entablature that mixes stone, wood, and terracotta. Um, just like a Temple A, it features a wooden architrave here. Um, uh, that was revetted with terracotta plaques, uh, which support a Doric uh, frieze in stone. Um, the right image gives you an idea of how you have to imagine the roof decoration with the winged uh, equatoria figures. And perhaps it strikes you uh, how colorful all these buildings are. And um, as it turns out, also Temple A was colored. Uh, this is the part where the methods of forensic archaeology come into play. On the tufa pieces of the capitals, um, especially on the volutes, the remains of a white stucco coating with color accentuations uh, can still be seen with the naked eye. But no one never noticed these remains, although the pieces were uh, lying in the storage rooms for almost a century. But uh, you only see what you know. And this kind of research question was not on the radar of most researchers until recently. So um, a surface mapping as here on the right always is the beginning of color analysis. And as it turned out, we are actually looking here at two different coatings with different color schemes. So coating one uh, features red and blue color accentuations against a white uh, background. So this is here red, here we see a trace of blue. Um, while coating two consists of yellow here, on white. In other words, the columns saw a renewal of their surface finishing, which implied a change of the color scheme. And this is actually a rather unique uh, discovery that within the hundred years that the temple was in use, it saw a, a change of color scheme. 
The samples from these coatings are currently in the lab in Paris waiting to be analyzed and published. Uh, but on site, we applied a non-destructive method which allows identifying the presence of a specific but uh, very common blue pigment, Egyptian blue. And this pigment strongly reacts to a specific wavelength of light and uh, it, this can be captured with a specially adapted camera. So the reflect the reflective parts on the right here um, are actually traces of Egyptian blue. Figuring out the distribution of the colors in relation to the architectural form is the next challenge uh, on which we are also currently working. As you can see, all this is work in progress. Here, um, a first and preliminary sketch. Uh, in the original coloring, um, so the, the first coating, uh, rather wide uh, blue and red bands highlighted entire fillets of the volumes. Uh, and you have to imagine a pristine white background for all of this, of course. Uh, the column shafts, by the way, were also kept white. Um, above these capitals, you have to imagine, of course, painted terracotta plaques uh, uh, of the architrave, uh, followed by a Doric stone and temperature also painted and a painted roof decoration. Um, and in phase, in our phase two, you see rather uh, delicate, delicate, uh, thin uh, yellow lines, uh, which follow the outlines of the volumes. So um, all this uh, still remains to be put together and visualized in a 3D model in the next step. The earliest temple must have been in use for more than a century, uh, as I said. Uh, Monica Cecchi, uh, our colleague and project partner, has recently reconstructed the scenario of its end in an article. And this uh, scenario involved a flood followed by a fire. In any case, uh, towards the end of the second century, Temple A was entirely renewed. And in doing this, uh, the core of the earlier temple uh, was reused. Um, and like a matroshka puppet, uh, the new temple um, incorporated the earlier one. So the architect simply added a new ring of columns around the earlier temple so that he could continue to use uh, the cellar. What you see here is our first sketch uh, that we made on the site when we realized what was going on. Uh, similarly, uh, the architect architect wrapped a new podium around the earlier podium. Uh, the result was a multi-columnar peristyle temple, meaning with a ring of columns around uh, the cellar on a flat uh, podium. This is in fact the recipe uh, for a Greek or Hellenistic temple. In other words, uh, with a relatively simple addition and with maximum efficiency, the architect managed to turn an Etrusco-Italic podium temple into a Greco-Hellenistic ritual temple. So far, uh, the late Republican, meaning the late second century BCE phase of Temple A was reconstructed as a peripteral temple. And on the right, you see a, a reconstruction from 2017 that is published. And uh, this is the plan that you usually find in the literature of this temple. But when you look more closely, you can see that there is a problem in this plan. Um, the axes of the columns uh, are not in line with the cellar walls. Therefore, the knot of the beams would not come to lie on the cellar walls. And this poses a fundamental problem and is practically impossible for aesthetic reasons. So um, the problem, however, becomes uh, this problem becomes obsolete when we add half columns around the cellar, as we did here, uh, as we know it uh, from so-called uh, pseudo peripteral temples. Then the axis lines are a perfect match for each other. But and indeed, we have evidence uh, that this was the case because we found remains of half columns and half column capitals, as uh, this one here. But uh, they must belong to the following construction phase to phase three, according to their material. Nevertheless, uh, since the ground plan of the building did not change for the rest of antiquity, so this plan determined all the rest of uh, antiquity, we must assume that also the temple of phase two had half columns around the cellar. This ground plan is indeed unique. Uh, when we compare it to the established typology of ancient temples, it would be a dipteros, a temple with two columnar rings 
only that the inner ring was attached to the cella. So uh, we therefore decided uh, to call it half column dipteros. So we had we introduced this new name uh, for this uh, temple type that was previously unknown. It seems as if the architect wanted to emulate with this the visual impression of one of the Greco-Hellenistic uh, dipero, dipteroi, as you see on the left. Um, these were giants uh, compared to Temple A. Um, but in the cramped urban situation of Largo, Argentina, our architect invented this uh, kind of shrink to fit solution. Uh, nevertheless, this building was the most costly and also the most innovative renewal of Temple A throughout antiquity. Uh, behind it uh, certainly stood one of Rome's aristocratic families, even though we don't know precisely which one, perhaps uh, the Catholic. In this uh, competitive uh, political climate of the late Republic, uh, you have to imagine buildings such as this uh, were means to eternally imprint a family name into the urban landscape. And this is, I think, how we have to understand this lavish building with its unusual con conception. It, it was an investment into the prestige of a family. I take the liberty again to skip over two restoration phases of the late Republican temple and move to our phase three, the last phase. After a well-known catastrophic fire of 80 AD, temple A was severely damaged and the debris from the fire made the level of the entire city quarter rise once again, this time uh, for 80 centimeters. So we move now from here to here. Um, but the earlier podium was already so low that it could not be reused. Therefore, the entire temple had to move up to adapt to the new city level. The solutions that were applied in coping with all this show an astonishing pragmatism as well as a maximum cost efficiency. The old podium was simply wrapped with a new one as before already, but this time uh, with brickwork. A concrete fill and travertine slabs were added on top to gain height onto here. Uh, the damaged tufa columns uh, were replaced uh, with uh, travertine columns such as this one here. And these replacement columns, one of them you also see here, um, were assembled from reused parts that were taken from somewhere else. As you can see here, the drums here, the drums didn't even fit the bases properly and therefore were coarsely ret retrofitted. So this is all a piecemeal from uh, material that was uh, brought together from elsewhere and recycled. And even the bases were not exactly the same. But all this didn't matter so much as everything disappeared under a stucco coating anyways. What is important to note here in this image is uh, that the columns uh, now had no fluting anymore, which means that they must have resembled monolithic columns uh, like those in granite that became fashionable at the time. Columns are in fact uh, among the most costly parts of a temple and therefore the imperial restorers wanted to reuse as many of the old tufa columns as possible and the blue ones here are the reused tufa columns from the predecessor. But at the same time, as I said, the entire temple had to move up. Uh, in this case, the solution was to just extend the old columns uh, by adding new necks in travertine. Here you see one of these uh, pieces. And at the bottom, uh, bases in brickwork were attached uh, to the column shafts. Uh, and here you see in situ uh, the remains of such a fake base. While we should not underestimate the technical challenges that are involved in all of this, uh, for example, attaching a column neck in travertine to the more friable tufa shafts, the approach clearly points towards cost efficiency. Um, here we have to keep in mind the changed socio-political conditions of the empire. Contrary to the Republic, the influence of the aristocratic families had greatly diminished. Many were even killed. And now it was the emperor who used public construction for his own representation. But he was also responsible for the upkeeping and maintenance of the public building stock. And this was a considerable financial burden for him. An anecdote of Suetonius tells us that after the fire of 80 AD, the emperor Titus said, I'm ruined. So uh, the architectural solutions that you see here seem to be the direct consequences of this economic pressure. 
maximum cost efficiency in restoring the image of a functioning city. And this was the job of the emperor. Here you see the last tangible phase of the ancient life cycles of Temple A, which perhaps dates around 200 AD and uh, involves a renewal of the surface. Only one location right here actually um, preserves uh, this, the evidence for this, uh, but it is rather unmistakable. A thick stucco coating reintroduced fluting to the columns of the temple. So after uh, over 100 years, it was decided we want flutes again. The form of these flutes uh, is rather atypical as they are relatively flat uh, with uh, broad fillets, almost like a mix of Doric and Ionic flutes. Most likely, however, this was not a deliberate aesthetic choice, but rather the result of what was technically possible. Deeper flutes would have been unstable, even if additional reinforcements uh, like bronze pins were used. So these flutes are the, an, an aesthetic compromise. Uh, in any case, uh, the um, visual impression of the temple, and now I only clicked uh, a little bit too late on this. Uh, here you see the, uh, the change, the visual, visual change to the columns, uh, which was uh, massive actually. The columns became much more sturdier and with the fluting, the effects of light and shadow came uh, back. So uh, let's return to the initial question, how did Temple A survive? Um, the life cycles and morphological developments of Temple A, as we have puzzled them together, or as we are about to puzzle them together from bits and pieces, provide us answers to this question on different levels. When looking at the architectural forms, we can see how an Etrusco Italic uh, podium temple was transformed into an innovative Greco Hellenistic multi columnar temple. Then we can observe how this architectural heritage uh, was uh, preserved and at the same time modified throughout the rest of antiquity, for example, the disappearance and reappearance of floating. In all this, architectural designs appear as the outcome of a multitude of parameters. And I hope I have uh, made that point extensively. Uh, these parameters are environmental, technical, and economic factors. Uh, and they were at least equally important as aesthetic preferences. So only in response to all these factors, Temple A was able to continue to function. This can then also, uh, yeah, on another level, be taken as a reminder how relative our textbook typologies are, including, of course, uh, the ideal canon of Vitruvius. And on a cultural level, I would say the story of Temple A, especially the late Republican invention of the half column dipters, ties into the debate on the Hellenization of Italy. And it shows us how creative the appropriation of Hellenistic forms was to the extent that they were turned into something generically different than the source of inspiration. So, and not at last, uh, Temple A tells us also a story of economic rationalization in the Roman building industry. Its architecture reflects an increasing pressure towards cost efficient solutions. And this also generated innovation. Behind this development stands as I have said, a change of the building patrons from an aristocratic elite during the Republic to an emperor and his officials. One important aspect is however still missing in the question why Temple A survived. And I mean the, other, the, the modern origins of the archeological site, which lie in the 1920s and the fascist regime of Benito Mussolini. Much has been written about the fascist era, uh, about how the fascist era has transformed the urban landscape of Rome on the ticket of archeology. span And this letter stamp on the upper left encapsulates the ideological background for these undertakings, returning to, to where we already were. Um, Mussolini wanted to lead Italy back to the grandezza of the Roman empire and the remains of the past should be a reminder of Italy's past glory and a tangible motivation to re-establish an empire, also through colonialism, of course. The demolition of buildings and the resettlement of entire city quarters, as here in this video at the Imperial Fora, should not stand in the way of all this. Uh, it was an all-encompassing nationalist, nationalist project. 
And in order to uncover Largo Argentina, and now uh, have a look at the image to the right, this entire city block here was demolished um, and removed, including the church of San Nicola e Cesarini, which was here and uh, which you see here in elevation. It was sitting right above Temple A. At the end, this highly problematic heritage also is part of the question why Temple A is still there. A new life cycle, and I'm now coming to the end, uh, is beginning right now at Largo Argentina in the form of this site management project. Praised uh, by the mayor of Rome as one of the successful private-public partnerships in the cultural heritage sector, the goal of this intervention here is to reopen the site to the public, to give it back to the people in a way. A series of landings will be installed on the site, uh, which guide visit visitors through a percorso. This here in brown is the percorso. It will also include a small exhibition with artifacts from the area, uh, and as far as I know, some virtual reconstructions. How we deal with the site now and what stories we decide to tell about it will, of course, uh, tell at least as much about ourselves as it will say about the past. So we can remain curious how the story continues. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Stefan, for a stimulating lecture, which will hopefully present a good starting point for the discussion. Um, as a reminder, uh, if you like to ask a question, please write it in the chat. That can be done on the live page and on YouTube. Um, and uh, you can ask questions in English and German. Uh, the important thing is that you use the opportunity to ask them. And I'm happy to pass them on to Stefan. As I can see, no question yet. Uh, I would like to start with one. I have plenty. Um, Stefan, um, you deliberately yeah. use modern terms such as life cycle. Um, how do these modern terms help but also affect our understanding of ancient building processes? That's a, uh, that's a good question. And I, I had in the longer version of this talk uh, a slide on exactly this uh, question of terminology. Um, I use the term building life cycle, which is um, a terminology, uh, a term borrowed uh, from modern architectural theory and it, uh, where it's used especially in relation to um, sustainable uh, building. So the, um, looking at uh, recycling, reuse uh, patterns in construction. But I think for us, for archaeologists and for architectural historians, especially when we were, who work on ancient periods, this is um, a rather, it's a very common uh, phenomenon. Uh, building life cycles are part of, uh, I would almost say, pre-modern construction. Uh, so uh, you're right, it's a modern terminology, but I think it's valid uh, to use it um, and but yeah, in, in a longer version of the talk, I would have maybe also had to de define it a little bit better, but thank you for the question. Um, yeah, what I uh, meant to say is uh, that also um, it uh, stipulates a certain kind of looking at things. So because you, you start looking at a different way, so but yeah. one has to be aware of that as well. Um, following yeah. up on that, uh, you have talked about uh, the difference between the dynamics, uh, building dynamics between the Republican and the Roman Imperial period. Um, you have described the uh, late Roman destruction or the uh, renewal of the temple uh, following a late Re Republican destruction as a lavish reinvention of the temple mm -hmm. and uh, the Roman one basically as cost efficient uh, maintenance. The imperial one, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can you put this in a broader context? Do you see the same if you, for example, look at the neighboring temple or if you look with this kind, with a set of eyes yeah. on your own experience from the Palatine Hill, do you see something similar or is this unique? Yeah, um, I. this is definitely another um, channel that could be opened. And uh, 
this is a, a more a wider phenomenon, of course. Uh, I'm not talking about uh, a unique case. Uh, the case is in, in so far unique that we can see it in its really long-term relationship uh, to what was before and what was after. And I think this is what makes it interesting. Uh, but of course, imperial construction, um, rationalization, uh, the discussion of rationalization, and um, cost efficiency is a much wider discussion um, that we can trace um, almost everywhere, I would say. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, as I said here, it's really in its, in its context that, that we can sort of assess what it means also, you know. There is a question now by Jonas Zweifel, who is uh, thanking you for the lecture, and he is asking if you have made any attempts to estimate the building time needed to carry out the restorations and reshaping of the temple, which must of course have been a factor in cost efficiency. Yeah, that's uh, that would be really nice, and there are there are a lot or quite a few very interesting studies recently that could serve as models for this undertaking. Um, but I think we're not there yet. Um, this question can be asked once we have a really a 3D model complete, where we can say, okay, this is as good as it gets. And now we have volumes, uh, we, can, we can really start calculations. Um, then that could be done, I think. And I'm not even sure if we have to do it. Maybe uh, that can be a different project that someone else wants to take up uh, because it's an important question, um, but that needs substantial data. Again, if I may follow up on that, uh, because obviously I'm also interested in the uh, process or in the question of reuse and recycling. Um, you have shown that example that this uh, Peperino tufa was used in one specific uh, building phase, making it possible to, enter, to identify reused mm -hmm. members in later phases. Um, and do you have any idea, and it goes in the same direction, about the quantity of recycling uh, and how to approach this question? I'm also thinking about uh, shattering building members in order to use them as cement in Opus Cementicium or uh, grinding roof tiles mm -hmm. uh, as an aggregate in mortar. But how do we trace these uh, issues on site? I mean, generally, I... I assume that nothing was transported away. <laughs> what, um, um, whatever they could reuse, they reused. And um, I mean, for example, the phase two temple, I didn't even mention this. Uh, I mean, we have along this development, you know, we also have technical innovation and uh, innovation of construction material. So in the phase two temple in the second century BC, uh, in contrary to the third century BC, they started to use Opus Cementicium, which was perfect for recycling all the pieces of the earlier temple. And even if they were burned or anything, you could just smash them into pieces. Um, so in a way, I mean, we also see here what we see on many uh, sites, also on the Palatine, is that you always find uh, the material from the predecessor in the current uh, building. Um, calculating these things, um, yeah, I mean, I think in a way that could be done in, uh, in, the, in, in the context of the same project that uh, Jonas Zweifel was uh, alluding to. Um, but also, yeah, you need really, you need really uh, good data and we're not there yet. Yeah. Uh, Lothar Haselberger is asking what would be your and your team's ideal scenario for the new presentation of the site? Yeah. Um, I personally, I mean, my, my, one of the reasons why, I mean, when you put slides together, you have an idea why you show things next to each other or following up on each other. And um, personally, my idea behind showing at the very end this new project was to suggest that um, this uh, space uh, for, for the public, this sort of little museum space that is planned there, should incorporate uh, parts of this long-term history 
but also the modern history uh, of the fascist era. Um, that in, in terms of like content that this site should have, uh, I think it's important. Um, there, this should not be just a fun and entertainment site. It should really also tell us something about the problematic parts. And I mean, this goes as far as colonialism in a way. Um, and that is content-wise something I would personally wish for um, in terms of uh, the architectural or the site management questions of the, um, what I would wish for is first of all, a uh, massive restoration work. And uh, if I may criticize something in this um, private uh, funding initiative, that is the company Bulgari who's funding this. Um, you can think what you want about private money and cultural heritage, but uh, um, uh, in a way you can also say money is money, but um, they do not pay for restoration work. They only pay for site management. And that is, for my, uh, to my mind, a problem because the site would first of all need a major restoration work tied to research and then a um, uh, substantiated uh, concept uh, for site management. I'm not saying, I mean, this is, this is what I'm, I'm quite happy with what they're doing now because it's kind of a minimal solution. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so far, yeah. um, I cannot yeah. come up with something. Uh, with restoration work, you probably mean conservation work. Uh, conservation, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so just yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Thank um, you for. And uh, so you, uh, you also yeah. argue for what someone calls the archaeology of what is no longer there. So to tell the story from the 1930s, uh, in particular, until today as well. And also talk about all the faces, the 12 <laughs> that have been lost uh, by uh, the demolition work in the 1930s. Yeah, yes. Okay. There is a question now by Dominic Maschek, uh, who also thanks you. Um, and he uh, says, you focused on economic and political reasons for the remodeling of the temple. Given the function of the building, to what extent could religious considerations or stipulations have played a role as well? Yes. Yeah, good question. Uh, thank you, Dominic. Um, they did. Um, and um, I also left uh, out this part. For example, we have in our phase two, the late Republican temple. Um, this building, interestingly, is, I mean, despite its uh, big investment and, you know, new, really fancy columns, everything was, was blown up uh, in scale and uh, lavishly uh, built, it reused the uh, steps uh, in Peperino Tufa of the earlier temple. So there is clearly, there seems to be a sort of um, 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 sacred connotation behind the reuse of, of the steps that have been for centuries, the steps where, for example, these families members went up and uh, uh, and, 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 and they were part of the liturgy of the earlier temple. So uh, things like this play a role. Yeah, definitely. Okay, um, I guess you also try to emphasize uh, the difference between two particular phases and uh, skipped over some details. Um, if I may come back to the restoration in the 19, or the excavations in the 1930s, uh, at the very end you said there is this one point where you have the preservation of a coating with flutes from the phase 3A. Yeah. Uh, another question I'm wondering about in other places as well, like in how far do we have to be aware that uh, these older excavations uh, and restoration measures were kind of looking for the original phase, uh, making it harder or somehow inadvertently even cleaning away later traces. Uh, but uh, luckily enough, they have been preserved. But do you think this is an issue mm. that uh, they were looking for um, the earlier rather than the later phases? Um. That's, I mean, that uh, the, the question could be asked here, what is the later phase and what is the earlier phase? Because if you consider the Baroque church, the later phase, uh, it's gone. Um, they really completely demolished uh, a complete church. I mean, there's, uh, there's pieces still on the site. Um, um, so this clearly shows a priority for something. Um, 
And this priority definitely was also there to get to the rep Republican faces of the site. But uh, your example from, I think you were talking about the, the flutes, the remains of the attached flutes. This piece, I, I suppose that this was really the only remaining piece. And um, as far as we know, this uh, there was a careful restoration. Uh, otherwise, this would be gone now. So they, the edges of this uh, were carefully uh, actually sealed so that it's not breaking away. So they were aware of this. And I have to say, generally, I have to, I have to give a lot of credit, of credit to Marchetti Longhi, the excavator of this area, because for his time, uh, he wrote quite a lot. Uh, and he had quite extensive uh, field uh, diaries and field notes, which uh, Monica Cecchi is now preparing for publication. Yeah. Another question by Claudia Winterstein, who is asking what your explanation mm -hmm. is for the massive rise of ground level, of the walking level uh, between mm -hmm. the temple phases one and two. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, um, that's um, um, probably it's, I mean, there's a, there's a geological study uh, in relation to this um, that has been carried out by Fabrizio Mara and apparently there was a big flood also. Uh, and this flood um, you can find um, all over um, the area. So that's one thing. And then uh, the other thing, it's, it's a very, this whole scenario reconstruction of this uh, transition is not so easy. And Monica, Monica Cecchi has been addressing it because at the same time, on one hand, there's this flooding. On the other hand, the excavator Marchetti Longhi found uh, substantial layers of ash in front of the temple. So this also seems to have been a fire. So it's possible that uh, these things, these events somehow followed up on each other. And then at some point it was decided, uh, you know what, we just have to, you know, redo the whole thing. Um, this is sort of the very simple version of it. Um, but you can read uh, this up in Monica Cecchi's work. Um, yeah. Uh, something else I'm wondering about is, uh, I, I called it dynamics, you called it dynamics. Uh, do you have an idea if uh, there is an acceleration process or uh, there is this tendency to say, obviously, if there has been a fire and a destruction, there is a reason to do something. So um, if you look on the long term development, uh, can you trace something like uh, processes of acceleration or the, diff or the opposite? Or is this always as far as we know, um, initiated by a specific event. Ah, you mean, uh, you mean with the opposite, you mean like, ah, like somebody is like, um, like, like, like embellishment. Like, like, Stefan, if I may be more precise, if yeah. you have a destruction, obviously you have to do something, yeah. but you stress that they changed the color scheme without yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, something like that, yeah. or they decided in favor of fluted columns instead of uh, non-fluted columns. Yeah. So yeah. this is a deliberate choice. And uh, is there something like every generation reinvents uh, the temple or not? I mean, I, that's, I, I personally I also think that there's a lot of uh, interventions that we have no evidence for. Because, I mean, you could assume, that's actually an interesting question. We have, as far as I know, we have no studies about uh, the ancient period, how often they would restore buildings. Um, but from, modern, uh, from a modern perspective, we say like at least every 50 years, it needs like a, a substantial renewal, uh, probably even before. Um, um, depending on what part. Um, but I assume that, I mean, we have eight phases in 500 years. I don't think that's enough. Uh, um, and um, probably the, the stucco phase uh, XY uh, escapes us. And, uh, and um, certainly there must be phases uh, that are not, uh, not related to a massive event like the ones we had. I mean, in a way, we only have the massive stuff. <laughs> That's kind of, we also have to say that, you know, a little bit of the smaller one also with this, uh, with these uh, painting remains uh, on, the, on the capitals. And that's why I think they're so important because they give us an insight into sort of 
the embellishment, you know, which actually also was an opportunity to change uh, the color scheme, which has a meaning on its own. You know? Yeah. Yeah, what I also try to say is looking uh, at your examples from the Eastern Mediterranean perspective, um, the kind of construction technique used are well suited uh, to adapt <laughs> and to yeah. restore and to, uh, yeah, to, to, to adapt to changing tastes as well, not just uh, for necessary reasons. Yeah. Yeah. No, this um, is, this is an, uh, what, I, what for me, what is fascinating about this project is that it, and, and this might be the end, the so-called shoe swap, um, is that it really shows something about uh, the very nature of Roman architecture and, and the very flexibility of this architecture, which is such a different image of, you know, the traditional Greek Parthenon architecture, <laughs> uh, uh, the, the notion of that, you know, yeah. yeah. Um completely agree um, and uh, I do not see any more questions uh, for that reason I would like to thank you again Stefan well, thank um, you. for thank insights you into the dynamics of building and rebuilding processes uh, in the Roman Republic and the Roman Empire uh, I would also like to thank you for uh, showing once again the potential of careful and cross-disciplinary research um, and I would also like to thank the audience for its attention and curiosity. And uh, last but not least, uh, I would like to invite you to our second lecture in two weeks. That is the 21st of July. Uh, it will be given by Ferran Antolin, head of the Division of Natural Science uh, at the Wissenschaftliche Abteilung here in Berlin. And his lecture is entitled uh, Ackerbau, Risiken und Resilienzstrategien im Neolithikum im nordwestlichen Mittelmeergebiet. And obviously it will be held in German. Uh, you can register by clicking on the relevant event under upcoming live streams further down this page. And with that, I would like to say goodbye and wish you a good evening.